So thanks for the opportunity to do this. Um, I've been asked to do something that actually nobody knows how to do. Um, and I love those kinds of assignments. Um, I, I say that because uh, th there is no place in the United States, at least, that you can go to and say, um, um, Here, here's a movement, just go learn from these people. Uh, th th there is no place like that. What, what is present uh, is a group of people across the country, in, mostly in the major cities, uh, who are uh, asking and answering that question together. Uh, much like this association, folks who are, who are um, acknowledging that, uh, that we're losing our city at supersonic speed, uh, and, and that that's not just true now, it's been true for more than 20 years. Uh, actually, if you, if, you, if you really dig into the trends about the city, we are 50 to 60 years in a decline, both as a percentage of the whole and with, with declining impact, uh, ability to impact the, the culture. I, I could do a dozen illustrations. I don't have time to do a dozen illustrations, but I could do a dozen illustrations. The, the one that I would do is to say we're in the, the third generation of a 50% divorce rate, and the church seems impotent to turn that trend around. And so, so what's happened in the face of all of that, that 60 years of decline uh, is that we do what we do in the face of being overwhelmed. What we do is we work harder at the things we've been doing, and we tend to turn inward and simply take care of what we uh, can, can, can put our hands on. Uh, so Dallas Willard is one of the guys who's really impacted me, and one of the things that he says is uh, that we're not going to change these trends until we come to the place that we can acknowledge that it's not in spite of our best efforts that we're in the condition that it's in that it's because of our best efforts. I just want to let that settle for a minute. What Dallas Willard is saying is we're, it, the fact that we're working hard at the things we're working at is what's producing the reality that we, uh, th th that we are uh, experiencing. And, and so this is not a very sexy presentation, and in some ways it is a painful presentation. Um, we live in a world where when, when, when things hurt, what we want to do is distract ourselves, medicate ourselves, entertain ourselves. And what I'm going to ask you to do for the, the 20 or so minutes that I'm going to talk to you now uh, is to do what you've got to do to increase your pain tolerance just a little bit so that you can hear some things that, that are being learned all across the country about how you reach a city, about how you generate a movement. Um, a part of what we want to say we want to use an AA term and to say to you today that, that if we're going to see a movement happen, we've got to recognize what I've just been saying, and it's the way we think about the problem that is the problem. Uh, you, would, you know from Scripture that, uh, that Proverbs tells us that as, that as we think, that so we are, that our thinking leads to the creation of the world that we live in. The Apostle Paul tells us to think about uh, uh, things that are true and noble, right, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Think about those things. Well, Paul wasn't just giving us some self-help talk so that we could feel good. What, what Paul actually recognized, I think, is that, that it is in the way that we think that we actually then get into action in the world that creates the world that we live in. I think a better place to go in the Bible to be able to see all of that is to go to the, the, the story in Acts. Uh, all of you know Acts 1-8. You know, it's the, if you know anything about the Bible, it's the place that, that Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Judea, in Jer Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But most folks don't, when, if you say, so can you quote Acts 1-6, most folks can't do that. Acts 1-6 says that when they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, if you get this today, it'll be worth the price of admission and I'll have accomplished what I came to accomplish. What in the world was happening in that moment? The disciples had lived with Jesus for three years. They had, they had had all the public conversations that are recorded. They've had lots of private conversations that we don't know about. They've seen him perform miracles. They've heard him teach. They've seen him crucified. They've watched him be resurrected. And then they've walked with him for 40 days. And at the end of all of that, what they're asking in this question is, now are you going to do what we've expected you to do all along? What we've expected you to do is to be an earthly king who is going to, uh, in the line of King David, establish an earthly kingdom with treasuries and armies. And what you're going to do is run the Romans out and put 
the Jews back in the place of political power in our culture so that we can go back to what we used to have. Even though Jesus had been saying over and over in a variety of ways that that wasn't the kind of kingdom that he was coming to establish, they didn't get it. Now, one way to look at that is to say, that's 12 of the slowest learners ever on the, on the planet. I think the other way to look at that is simply to recognize that uh, what you see working here is a mental model. Now, that, that sounds like a real esoteric term. A mental model is simply a set of pictures that you carry around in your head that help you know how to take effective action in the world. God designed us to have mental models so that you wouldn't have to think about every thing that comes along. You, don't, you can generalize about a lot of stuff. You know, if, if Laura comes in and says, Jim, I've got a headache, what do I do? I don't do this. I don't go, oh, wait, a head. Oh, that's this part of the body. An ache. I had one of those one time. What was it? Oh, yeah, that's that dull roaring pain that I get behind my eyes. What did I do when that happened? Oh, what I did was I took a, Laura, take an aspirin. I don't do that. I'm just able to generalize and say whatever you would say. Take a Tylenol, go, take, go drink some water, get some rest but I instantaneously have a response, and that instantaneous response grows out of the, the mental models that I hold about the human body and about how to take care of a headache. Well, we have a set of mental models about, uh, about what it means to reach a city. Uh, and a part of what I want to hold up for you today is that one way to read the book of Acts is to read it from the perspective of watching what the early disciples had to learn in order to have their mental models shifted. When Jesus was ascended, you know, the, the disciples didn't say, okay, guys, we're not Jews anymore, we're Christians. That whole view of the world that they held was so deeply ingrained that as you go, there really is a very powerful way to read the book of Acts that helps you watch what Tom was saying a moment ago, and that is that it is a faith walk. There is this journey that they were on. I promise Peter didn't, didn't when Jesus was, uh, uh, was ascended, didn't say, now let's see if we can get the Gentiles in. It, it was not part of his worldview. It was not a part of something that he could even consider. But he had a series of experiences uh, that, that led him to a new way of viewing the world. And what I want you to get today is that if we're going to see a movement emerge in our city, we've got to recognize that mostly the way that we think about solving the problems that we face is the problem. So um, I'd ask the question, you know, what do you think it would take to reach a city? What actions would be required? What are the outcomes for which we look? Now, what we do is we hear a question like that, and out of our mental models, we give answers, right? Out of our mental models, we give answers. And so, so a part of what it takes to foster a movement is that we've got to learn to be more disciplined in our thinking. And mostly, like the early disciples, our thinking shifts and emerges out of new experience. And so in Acts 6, there's this story of the distribution of the food. And that experience propels them forward. And then there's the experience of, of, of Peter and Cornelius and the whole story of Gentiles being baptized. And I love, the, I love it. It's in about, about Acts 14 when John and, and, um, and, and James call Peter back to Jerusalem. So, and obviously I'm reading between some lines and inferring some stuff, but it's like, get your buns back up here to Jerusalem. What were you thinking? We got to have a conversation about this. And they did have a conversation about that. And so what happened is that their view of the world shifted over time as the Holy Spirit led them into new kinds of actions, and then they reflected upon their actions. Okay, so... Um, Folks who do what I do, and there are, there are, there are Mission Houston-type organizations in every major, country across the, every major city across the country. We're actually meeting together uh, on, on a regular basis. I, I'm in a part of a, a thing called the Ten City Learning Covenant that, that Boston, New York, uh, Atlanta, Chicago, Houston, Dallas, Phoenix, Denver, um, 
San Diego, and Portland are all in. And we're coming together for two days uh, uh, on an annual basis, and we're sharing our learning with one another. And one of the things that's growing out of our coming together is that we're recognizing that there's two things about our current thinking that are a part of the problem. One of the things about our current thinking is discipleship that's based in information delivery and based on church membership. So if, if we had time today, I, I, I'd intended to let you do some talking around the table and we're not going to get that done, but if we had time today and we ask you, so how do you make a disciple? Now, I'm not asking you what your theory is. I'm asking you what your actual practice is. Actually, what our practice is is that we deliver information to people. They come to the church, we have programs, we teach them how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible, how to pray, how to know church history. We deliver that information to them, and we deliver that information in a context that has an assumption about our worldview. Now, stay with me, this is really important. So the worldview that exists in most Western Christians is that for those of us who are not pastors, is that I have my work over here, and I have ministry over here. And so I go to work for 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week, and I do that there, and that's a secular thing that I do. And over here is where my ministry is. And so I go to church, and I go to a small group, and I take a mission trip, and maybe I volunteer in the church to teach children or count money or park cars or, or sing in the choir or do something out there. And so our, our delivery of information doesn't even challenge the existing paradigm or the existing mental model that allows the, the, the secular to be over here and ministry or the sacred to be over, the, over there. And mostly our disciple-making experiences don't challenge that. If they did, our disciple-making things would be asking the question, um, so if Jerry Gallion was here, Jerry's the senior counsel for Kirby Corporation. I don't, I don't know a layperson here but the, who's, who I can see and call their name, but I know Jerry. And so if our disciple-making processes weren't doing what I'm describing, then, then as a pastor, what I would be doing is I would be asking the question, how do I equip Jerry to be a missionary where he spends most of his day? But see, I don't do that. What I do is I say, so I want to teach Jerry how to read the Bible and pray and do these things, and then what I want to get him to do is to figure out how he can serve the church, how he can serve the ministry of this local congregation. The other big challenge that we face is a challenge that has church planting that grows out of an attractional paradigm. Now, as is almost always the case when I'm asked to, Betty, Betty, <laughs> Betty says I'm the only person that somebody says, what time is it, Jim? And I tell them how to build a clock. Uh, it's true. Uh, and so I, I'm, I, I'm, I apologize for that. But there's a whole bunch to say about church planting that grows out of an attractional model. Uh, so all of us had our mental model established about church that says it's a building, even though theologically we would say we don't believe that. Practically, it's a building. We go to the building. Uh, good church members bring other people to the building. The gospel is delivered there. The, the resources of the church are delivered there. Church happens at that building. And so what we've done is we've grown up a whole mental model of church growth that is about attracting people to come to that facility for information that can be delivered <laughs> to folks who are living this compartmentalized life. You, you begin to see how we're falling down a rabbit hole? So in, these, in this 10-city learning, what we're saying is that there are lots of places we could begin trying to rethink our thinking, but that the two highest leverage places to think about rethinking our thinking is to rethink how we make disciples and then to rethink what it means to be a local congregation and to plant local congregations. So every now and then I just feel the need to take a breath and, and let that, because uh, I know you're processing this as, as you go along, and you're processing it in the context of your, of your own setting. In this 10 city learning community, we universally whether it's New York or San Diego or Houston and Dallas, no, no matter what part of the country you're in, when we come together, we've come together for three years, and every year one city takes the whole morning and then one city takes the whole afternoon and they present a case study of what God is doing in their city and how they're working to, to foster a movement in their city. We're talking about where we're getting results and what we're learning and where we think we're stopped and where, the, you know, what, where all that is. And these two things are the challenges that every city across, if you came to a, the 10-city learning 
community uh, that happens in, in Manhattan, New York, every September, all 10 cities would say universally, these are the biggest challenges that we think. And mostly the way we think about this is the problem in solving this problem. Um, and so, uh, if you turn that on its head, what I want to then take a minute to do is to talk about two high leverage shifts in thinking that will foster a movement. If we can begin to think differently about these two things, uh, and, and you would think, wouldn't you? I mean, thinking is such an easy thing to do, right? Anybody wake up this morning and think, oh, I need to think. You know, you just wake up thinking. And so you would think that thinking differently would be a, an easy thing to do. The power of a mental model is seen in Acts 1-6. It's not easy. It's the most difficult stuff that we do. And left to our own devices, we're just going to keep thinking the way we've been thinking. And so it requires that we confront our thinking and that we discipline our thinking and that we allow one another to challenge our thinking and that we, uh, that, that we, that we uh, continue to examine how the way we're thinking produces results that we get. Two high leverage things that the cities across the country that I'm connected to are saying would really uh, produce high leverage uh, change. The first is experiential disciple making that equips people to be missionaries in their real world. I, lo I love Tom's uh, description of what the gospel is. I love Tom's description of what the gospel is. I, I grew up in the Southern Baptist tradition where it was a very narrow, one-sided, uh, and incomplete definition of the gospel. All I was interested in was leading people to Christ so they could go to heaven. But Tom's held up a picture of a much wider view of what, it, of what it means to do the gospel, what it means to be a missionary. I grew up in a world where I was a church member who lived this compartmentalized life with the secular over here and the sacred over here, and missionaries were people that we gave money to. They were like higher called people. You know, they were the people who God really called, and I was just a church member who was called to pay their way to go do that stuff. One of the shifts in our thinking is that we've got to learn how to make disciples who actually become missionaries. Faith Walking is Mission Houston's ongoing um, learning community to figure out how you make those kinds of disciples. In Faith Walking, we say that our end game is that people will live missionally in the place that they spend most of their day. That they'll live missionally, they'll be missionaries, in the place that they spend most of their day. And we've been testing that against real results. Part of the reason you've got to test against real results, if you don't, what you'll do is you'll let your thinking lead you to do the things that are easy and comfortable and that you enjoy doing. But when you actually measure progress, then you're in this uncomfortable position of saying, we're not getting the results that we said that we wanted. And so we said our end game is missional communities. We want missional communities where people spend the most of their day. And today we've got about 50 of those. We've got about 11 in public schools here in Houston where there is a group of people who are followers of Jesus who are not only trying to be good school teachers, but they're asking the question, what would it look like for the full impact of the gospel to come to this school? What would it look like for this school to function in all of the fullness of the shalom of God in this place? We've got... We've got um, We've got missional communities in publicly held companies. Jerry Gallion's story is the story of the Kerbit Corporation. They're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. People would say you can't do mission in a publicly traded company. Not only are they doing mission there, but they have, they have become so, uh, had so much impact that they're changing the culture of Kirby Corporation, helping the corporation to begin to ask implicitly, What's the reason that we exist for, and how do we learn to find ways to serve our community? I don't have time. You can go to our website. There's just amazing stories of how this corporation that's at the corner of Wall and Memorial, 10-story building with about 1,000 employees, how there's this group of about 125 believers who've been mobilized to work in that place, and they're helping that company understand who it is and for what purposes God created. Not, not by preaching and, 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 and Bible thumping and telling people that they need to be more moral, but by volunteering for task forces that are going to do strategic plans and getting on committees and groups where decisions about the culture of the company uh, get made. And in the midst of that, they're praying together and they're doing Bible studies together. And they're doing that with people that they see eight or nine hours a day. 
We've got public, and we've got the missional communities in um, in impoverished neighborhoods. Uh, Fifth Street out in Fort Bend County is is perhaps the most impoverished community in, in Fort Bend County, and there's a team of nine people in a missional community who come from seven churches in the Sugarland, Stafford, Missouri uh, City uh, uh, area. Uh, and the work that they are doing is amazing. They, 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 they've gone to Armstrong Elementary and have an after-school program and a mentoring program. And at a, at a recent teacher, I mean, a volunteer appreciation thing, uh, the principal stood up and actually held up statistics of all the kids in that school who were being mentored and, and talked about how many of their grades had improved, how much of their attendance had improved, how how what they call flybys, a flyby is a kid who just regularly flies by the office because he can't make it in the classroom, how, how the number of visits they've made to the office have declined. And so, so, so that's our attempt to, uh, to create an experiential disciple-making uh, experience that equips people to be missionaries in the place that they spend most of their day. The second, um, so I want to say one more thing about that. <laughs> um, well, no, I'll say that in a minute. The second thing is, is uh, strong parts of a gospel ecosystem that are connected and interconnected to the whole. So when Mission Houston got formed, and, and Tom and Diane and Ron and so many, Sally, so many people who were at UBA were part of forming Mission Houston uh, 14 years ago. And when we, we, formed, we formed out of a fundamental conviction, and it was that there's one church in the, in the greater Houston area with many congregational and ministry expressions. Now, that's a very challenging theological assumption. Uh, what, what I'm discovering is that uh, as long as everybody who I want to be in unity with believes what I believe, wants to practice the faith the way I, the way I want to practice it, wants to pray and baptize and do worship the way I want to do it, then I'm all about unity. But the moment they want to do something different, then that becomes more challenging. And then if they don't want to let me be in charge, it really becomes challenging because they're going to take me to places that I've, uh, I've not been. And yet, that conviction has continued to, to guide us that there's one body in the city, with, 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 there's one church with many congregations and ministry that make up the whole. And so if you think about all you know about the body, about the physical body and about the teachings of the body that come from Paul in the, uh, in, in the New Testament, what we recognize is that, you know, my kidney cells, when a kidney cell and a brain cell are originally birthed, they are identical. But over time, they get differentiated, and they become a kidney cell, and they become a brain cell. And though my kidney cell and my brain cells interact with each other and make my body function the way that it's designed to function, my brain never wonders, hmm, I wonder if I'll be a kidney today. And so, so what we tend to do is we tend to say, well, I can hold my unique view of things, and UBA has a unique view of, of, of the world and how it exists and what it means to be faithful to the gospel. I can either do that or I can be a part of the whole. And what we're saying is that it's not one or the other. It's one and the other. Now, again, like what I said earlier, we learn new mental models by experimentation. Tim Keller is one of the, probably one of the most famous pastors in the country. He pastors Redeemer um, Presbyterian in Manhattan, right in, right in the heart of Wall Street. He's been the pastor there for about 20 years, and he's going to publish a book this summer entitled The Center City Church. What their church has been doing for about a decade what they've been doing for about a decade is they've been getting all the people who work on Wall Street together and saying, what does it look like for you to be salt and light and leaven in Wall Street? And they've been getting all the folks who are artists and actresses and actors together and saying, what does it look like for you to be on mission in that world that you live in? And they've been getting business people together and saying, what does it mean for you, you to be on mission? And, and they've had enough experience with that, that that they're getting some success, enough success that Tim is going to write. It's called the Center City Church, and, and, and what, I was on a, on a phone call with him just a couple of weeks ago, and in that conversation, he said this thing. He said, the greatest challenge that we face to seeing what he calls uh, gospel movements in our cities is that the individual parts think they have to either choose the part or the whole, rather than choosing the part and the whole. 
And so strong parts of what Keller calls a gospel ecosystem, he uses the imagery of a gospel ecosystem. And so where you and I would talk about congregations, he talks about prayer movements, student movements, local congregations, geographic movements, collections of people like uh, Jeff McGee is partnering with out in the Copperfield area where they're saying we're, we're going to partner in a geographic area. Uh, they're talking about uh, justice movements. They're, they're, they're talking about the ecosystem being full and complete and that the way you the way you foster a movement is that you strengthen each part and then you strengthen the connection of the whole. And so congregations and UBA and Mission Houston have to ask the question, how do we allocate time and resources in a way that makes our part really clear about what our part was designed to be so that we can be the best part that that is? And we have to ask the question, how do we allocate time and resources to the whole in a way that actually has us interconnected and communicating? So finally, I want to ask the question, how do you learn these two things? How do you learn to do a disciple-making uh, process that actually releases missionaries into the place that they spend most of their day? And how do you, how do you plant, foster a church planting movement that equips those kinds of missionaries? Um, so the first thing that I want to say before I put that slide up, there's, there's something I want to say about that that I had to find in my other notes. Oh, yeah, okay. So... So with the, with the Ten City Learning Community and with Mission Houston, uh, one of the things that, that Tom and Diane and Ron and I particularly were a team of people who worked on this 20 years ago. We got introduced to a, to a, to a guy who's a learning expert, and he hel held up this model for us where he said, when you want to learn your way into a new paradigm or into a new mental model, what you've got to do is you've got to have a working theory. And then what you do is you go test that theory in the real world. And then what you do is you come pull away from the practice to reflect on the theory to see what, what part of the theory worked and what didn't. And then what you do is you refine the theory. And the reason you need a working theory is so that it can be replicable. But what, what we're talking about is a working mental model. And so we acknowledge that our existing mental model is working against us. How do we get a new mental model? We develop a working theory. I've been offering one to you today, the working theory that there's two high leverage places, one around discipleship, one around church planting. We go test that theory with some real measurable results. We pull away, we reflect on that theory, and then we modify the theory, and then we repeat the process. And so faith walking, our experiential discipleship making process, is a six-year-old experiment that we've been tracking results and making changes at every point along the way. So... So when I ask the question, how do we learn these two things, it's in that framework of an ongoing theory, practice, reflection. What happens in local churches is they'll get a working theory. They'll say, oh, let's go try this. And then they'll try it, and it doesn't work, and they'll say, oh, we tried that. That didn't work. Rather than saying, oh, we had a working theory. We tried that. Now, what did we learn from that? There's some things we learned that we keep. There's some things we learned that we don't keep. We revise the theory, and then we try again. Um, so I'm going to take five more minutes, and I'm going to be done. Uh, in addition to the 10 City Learning Community that I'm a part of, Tricia Taylor and I, many of you know Tricia Taylor is a counselor with the UBA Center for Counseling. Uh, she, she was for a long time. She's living in Austin now. But she and I partnered together in writing a book with Robert Creech called The Leader's Journey, and we got invited by Western Seminary in uh, Holland, Michigan, right outside of, 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 um, of Grand Rapids, um, Holland is, um, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, my brain's not working. Uh, Western is the Reformed Church in America's primary seminary. George Hunsberger, who is one of the leading voices in helping congregations move from attractional to missional, in their, in, in their mental model is a, is a faculty member there. And, and George and some other guys invited Tricia and I to, to, to form a learning community with what ultimately became 30 congregations where we would help them create a learning environment where they could ask and answer the question, how do we take on these two things that I've been describing to you? We've been doing that for five years. We've had more success in, in this five-year journey than, than all of the other experiments that I've worked on along the way. The, the most 
the most common word that comes out of the reports of both pastors and congregational leaders in this experience is that for the first time in a long time, we have hope that we could impact the communities and the world that we live in in ways that we've not ever experienced. Out of five years, we've learned these four things about how to learn um, what we've got to learn. The first one is that you have to have high expectations. The old paradigm has deep roots in our thinking and practice, and without high expectations for change, what will happen is we'll just revert back to the We'll just revert back to the uh, to the to, to what we've been doing. It when, uh, when Betty and I planted Harbor Church and began doing a house church with a bunch of folks who were in recovery from drugs and alcohol. I can't tell you how many times we had the conversation. This doesn't feel right. I don't like this. I don't like what we're doing. Uh, if it hadn't been the clear call of God to do that, we would have quit. If we hadn't had a really clear, high expectations that we had to learn how to do that work. We had quit a long time ago, and so the first thing is high expectations. The second thing is that you do it in community. Pastor and congregational leaders learning, practicing, reflecting, and engaging in further learning. Uh, I, I remember back in the early days of my work at UBA, we did this thing called the UBA Institute. And I'll never forget, we, we were at Park Place Baptist Church. There were 30 churches that were in the room. We were trying to teach them some of what we were learning. And at lunch, I sat down across from a guy named John, 80 years old, from a church on the east side of the city. And I said to him, so, John, how, how's it going? And he said, you know, it's going pretty good. I, 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 I was really young then, and I, I offended a lot of people in the early days of our work here, and I wasn't sure whether he was one of the guys that I'd offended, you know, so I wasn't sure what I was going to get from him, but he said it was going pretty good. And I said, so tell me what's going, which seminar have you been to? What's been so good about it? Well, he said, you know, it's not the seminar so much. I mean, they've been good, but he said, what's really been good for me is that I thought the problems that we were facing were just our problems, and it's like there it was something wrong with us. He said, there's about 20 or 30 congregations here that are all dealing with the same stuff we're dealing with. There's something empowering about that. And so with doing it in community with pastor and congregations and a cluster of pastor and congregations uh, who have been engaged in that information practice reflection cycle. The third thing is in and out of context. Uh, new material is learned in a location outside of the congregational context. So you, when you go to your church, there's a whole set of forces that are at work that keep you doing what you've been doing. They're invisible, but they're very powerful. And so getting away for a three-day retreat, being able to not only hear new ways of thinking and thinking about practice, but then actually being able to reflect on that, getting some time of solitude, wondering about what stops you from embracing this, hearing from other people as they tell their stories and their setting, in and out of context, new materials learned on location, and then... What we've had these guys doing is at the end of a three-day retreat, we go back and say, okay, now that you've learned this, now go put this in practice. You're actually going to go practice what we've been teaching you. We're actually going to get into action. We're going to do some coaching for you on a monthly basis between the retreats, and we're going to reflect with you about what you're learning, where you get stopped and where you get stuck. And then the fourth thing is over time. Uh, taking on core learning commitments and becoming masters of that learning over time. The mental model that you and I embrace was given to us. It actually, I think, uh, you, you could, there, in Baptist life, the one that we mostly live out of got, got given to us in about 1940. Uh, and those guys were pioneering missionaries who said, we live in a context where we've got to figure out how to take the gospel to them. And over time, they developed a set of mental models that helped, to, um, uh, th that helped them to figure out, help us to figure out how to do, the, do what we've done in the context that we live in. Okay, in a really short period of time, I've said a whole lot of stuff. I want to come back to summarize and, and say three things to you. Until we take on our thinking, uh, we're, the, the trends of the last 50 years are simply going to continue, and the 3% in New York is going to be Houston in 20 years. The two things that we've got to learn to think differently about and to practice differently that is, is pretty universally agreed, at least among these 10 cities that I'm connected to through this learning community, are l taking on the question of how we make disciples who become missionaries and taking on a church planting movement that actually creates missional churches um, um, that, that live and do life in a different kind of way. And in order to do that, we've got to figure out how to learn together. What, what Tom and the team here are doing for you guys is... Um, uh, is, is stellar work that's 
helping you to take on the kind of thinking about how we make disciples and about how we plant churches. Um, if you had asked me five years ago before the Ten City Covenant emerged, I would have said uh, I had grown tired and resigned and cynical, uh, that the trends that I'd worked as hard as I had ever worked uh, for a long, long period of time, and I just come to the conclusion that we were not going to find any success around any of that stuff in our city. But in the last five years, there's this emerging uh, movement uh, that's happening in cities across the country, and what we've got to do is we've got to take the posture of a learner and allow God to create a movement, and that movement's going to grow out of learning to think differently. The interesting thing about all of that is that the heart of the heart of the heart of what it means to be a disciple is, is it means to be a learner. And so I, I thank you for journeying with us about that. Thank you for letting us journey with you about that. We consider UBA to be one of the best partners that we have in the city uh, for taking on and embracing these conversations. And uh, it always helps me to just say out loud what I'm learning. And if I say this a week from now, it'll be different. But thanks for letting me uh, do that with you today. So how do you end this thing? Do I pray or do you want to come pray? or I'll do it. I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Thanks. <laughs>